With puppets, the soul is in the eyes. That's what a critic wrote about the Fisher folks Orpheus 20 years ago. Now, shivering in an April cold snap, Albert Fisher sat at his workbench, groping for a soul. He finished painting the white of an eye, turned the glass glob between his thumb and forefinger, picked up its mate, and met their gaze, a steely glint of cruelty. He sighed and thumbed the paint off the back of the glass. He'd try again after lunch. Hello. I'm Conrad Bishop. And I'm Elizabeth Fuller. And we've spent most of our life writing plays, but we're now writing fiction. This is our new novel, Galahad's Fool. For us, it's deeply personal. Coming out of 57 years together and well over a half million miles of our mapless journeys. It's not autobiographical, I'm not dead yet. But it does center on the challenge of collaboration. In a working marriage, in the grit of hardscrabble touring, and in the stark inevitability of loss. It's been fun and fierce, but who knows for how much longer. Three days before the end, he was in her hospital room. They knew these were the final days, and she had asked that he read from old play scripts they'd staged. The comedies were the hardest to endure. It seemed that every laugh was followed by a pain too exquisite for the morphine to touch. For Albert, it was almost impossible to flatten the cry in his voice. He was midway into The Green Bird, a comedia full of enchantment and love. It swept him into a memory of rehearsing the comic bits, the clown eating flies, trying to kill himself without farting, hiding his monstrous erection, and he almost forgot that he sat by a deathbed. When he came to at the end of an act and looked up, Lainey was staring at him, eyes blazing, holding out her cupped hands as if offering water. He leaned forward and laid his face in her hands. Now it's a year after her death. Albert is trying to work on his first new show since then. He intends a lightweight spoof, kind of a Monty Python thing, a paunchy middle-aged Sir Galahad on another mad quest for the Holy Grail. But it goes a different direction. All was prepared. Galahad donned his full armor. A few miles down the road, he would change into practical traveling gear, but a lord's departure called for spectacle. The force of 300 men was slow to get itself arranged. The vassal knights were to ride at the head of the column, followed by Galahad himself. Archers and pikemen would trot behind and the conscripts at the rear. The whore's wagons would meet them outside the village. Galahad saw the peasants standing by the roadway, muttering. They would be grousing about the new taxes, but what was he to do? He had made a vow. So we seesaw back and forth between Albert's struggle, designing the puppets, writing the script, devising the staging, and the story that takes shape. He conceives a hero with all the egocentric drives that he loathes in himself. And a court fool, Sammy, a frail androgynous creature whom the knight's Lady Mara persuades to teach her his skills. Now, teach me to dance the way you dance, Sammy, and teach me the songs. Teach me to be a fool. When Galahad departs, Mara secretly changes guises with the fool to go with him. A plot twist that Albert's quirky costumer, Jeanette, calls into question. So why does the lady go along with him? How are we supposed to believe that? Because it's in the script, he wanted to say. If we say it, they'll believe it. That's why they'll vote for gangsters. That's why they gobble carcinogens. 
Instead, he replied, well, who knows why we do stuff? Why am I doing this? I have no idea. That's not enough. She's giving up her life. What, her embroidery? She doesn't know who she is. That's what she's discovering. By serving this guy's obsession? She had hit a sore spot. Well, don't you think that women ever behave like idiots? You think women need a man to tell them that? She was one of those ladies who never punched straight ahead, but had a mean left hook. Well, you tell me. She has to do it, since that's the story, so would you do it? Her eyes grew distant, focusing on something he couldn't see. She seemed to have experience with inexplicables. I might do it if the guy was headed to Bermuda. She smiled. The first time he'd seen her smile, she was a frugal smiler. No, I don't know. I've gone on some of those trips and wound up asking why. She wants to escape. She wants something to believe in. She wants to hold on to the memory. Maybe she thinks you can keep a memory on life support. I guess we try. Albert struggles to keep his head above water and to stay moderate with the vodka and to bear the pain of Lainey's absence and to cope with the growing attraction to Jeanette. And Galahad's quest has become a bloodbath. He's not doing too well. His own faith was at an end. He was writing theatrical roadkill scenes he could never stage. He had trapped his characters in a dark age so bleak that none could escape. They were dragging suitcases filled with concrete through seasons that washed backwards winter to fall, fall to summer, summer to spring to winter, for no reason except to reflect the confusion in his head. No more Galahad. The show was dead in the water. Leave the poor stiff staring into his bonfire. The burning desire, the loneliness, the lies too full of bitter self-mockery. Who would notice if he quietly put the project out of its misery? His daughter, yes. She knew that her father lived for his work, that it kept his fire alive. He would have to endure her pain, or he would have to lie. He'd probably lie. And Jeanette. She was on a roll with the designs, but it wouldn't be the first time she'd been dumped. It would be generous to offer her half the fee, more than generous. If she insisted, he'd give her the whole damn thing. He'd kidnapped himself so it was only right that he'd have to pay the ransom. Just before sitting down to supper, he picked up the phone and told her what he'd decided. A long silence, and then she said, Let's talk. And by fits and starts it moves ahead. The show happens, and a possible renewal. That final night, Albert let the puppet fall to the floor. He faced the 30-odd people, reached out with Laney's cupped hands, the gesture he'd known from the start, and offered drink. In those few seconds, final audience, final show, he knew it was all illusion, his fingers to their hearts and theirs to his, but an illusion deeply felt. He had touched belief. Belief wasn't a constant thing, it wasn't a state of bliss or the rock star surfing backward over his fans like seaweed on the breakers. It was a night mosquito buzzing in your ear. However you tried to slap and kill it, the damnable thing returned. You had to depend on that. So, we hope you can hitch to our journey. 